Okay, we're back. We're live. We're at Think Tech here on a given Friday with a special show. More, much more on medicine with Dr. Sarah Park of the Department of Health, state epidemiologist. And it's an important show because we have important events happening uh, around the world on coronavirus. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Park. It's great to have you here. We appreciate you taking the time off in what must be, must be a very busy time for you to discuss this yeah. with us and the public. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So what, what is the status as far as we know? Uh, you know, it's funny that at the beginning of this, um, every headline was, uh, you know, worth looking at. And everybody was getting concerned um, and the world was reacting in every which way. Uh, articles in all the newspapers and so forth and every single media. And now it seems to have subsided. Uh, there's not as much. Uh, you don't hear all that emergent talk. And I wonder, you know, what that means. Maybe it means that the media cycle is over and it's going to get quiet until the next remarkable thing. Or maybe there's uh, good news uh, on the horizon. What do you think? Um, actually, that's news to me that there's a lull because um, it seems like it's just a constantly, there's something constantly coming out. So um, that would be news to me. I don't think that uh, we're out of the woods yet by any means. What, when will we be out of the woods? I mean, from a medical point of view, from an epidemiological point of view, I mean, you have, you have two possibilities. One is a vaccine is developed, but everybody says that'll take a year. And, and thanks to the Chinese for sharing the genome with us, because it helps to have the genome mm -hmm. in order to make a vaccine. Uh, they may have done other things wrong, but that was a good thing if they shared the vaccine, or rather the genome. Mm -hmm. And the other possibility is it burns itself out, as all mm -hmm. epidemics ultimately do. So which, right. do you, which do you think will happen first and how will we know when we're out of the woods on this, Dr. Park? I, you know, I have no idea which one will actually go um, first, but um, I think it's important to stress that the, the um, outbreak in China is still ongoing, that there is um, new disease um, being identified in, uh, they're actually in 27 different countries now, um, is my understanding. And, um, you know, it, everyone's monitoring the situation very closely. Um, at this point, the World Health Organization has deemed it not a, yet a pandemic in that they feel that um, pretty much all the disease activity can, or most of it can be still traced back directly or indirectly to China. Um, and I guess I gather what they're waiting for to, is to see that um, they start to see disease that isn't directly or indirectly traced back to China. Um, uh, my understanding is that they feel that uh, the tactic that the world has to employ right now is to try to contain um, the virus in China, uh, but uh, there is always a distinct possibility. I mean, this is a respiratory pathogen, um, so it uh, is transmitted primarily through what we call respiratory droplets, uh, basically when you cough and sneeze. Um, if you think about the regular flu and how quickly that spreads, um, during the traditional flu season, which we're in the middle of, uh, then it's not really a stretch then to think about how easily this virus could uh, potentially take hold and, um, you know, uh, end up being uh, uh, more widespread beyond China's borders. So it is a concern worldwide still. I, I, you know, that's what I meant when I said we're not out of the woods yet and that everyone's still leaning forward, still monitoring the situation closely. Um, in the meantime, many countries, including ours, uh, are instituting travel bans and other measures, screening procedures to essentially um, help with uh, containing the virus in China, but also to slow down, basically create a bottleneck for uh, any potential introduction into our country. Um, I think it's important for people to understand that screening at the airports is not an absolute uh, control measure and that uh, we all recognize that there is still the potential for individuals to, still to, um, you know, be infected and come into our country, but it is a way to slow it down and slow it down enough so that, you know, our prevention measures can, you know, uh, effectively control um, any introduction and prevent it from spreading, you know, further than potentially even that one person, maybe just a small cluster. Um, and those Prevention measures are really those things that you hear us talking about every flu season, every time there's a respiratory disease outbreak um, or, you know, anything related to really any infectious disease. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's stay home when you're sick. Uh, you know, I think that has to really be the primary message right now for all of us across the globe. 
um, as well as especially in Hawaii, is that we need to really practice uh, staying home when we're sick. Um, and that means not going to work, not going to school, not getting on the bus, not going shopping, not running errands, you know, really stay home until we're well and getting our employers to enforce that, so to speak. And um, that would go a long way, honestly, towards preventing anything from happening here or anywhere else. That in addition to hand washing. Um, and then if you are sick, covering your cough and sneeze, basically keeping your germs to yourself. If we can all as a community practice these um, simple infection prevention measures, then we could go a long way in terms of preventing anything from, you know, being introduced and then spreading uh, more widely in our community. Yeah, drilling down on some of that, uh, Dr. Park, um, so I'm home uh, and that's the wise thing for me to do if I, I feel I have a, some kind of respiratory thing happening. Um, but my family may be home also. How do I prevent sure. my family from getting infected and then going out into the, into the community and delivering it, uh, you know, second hearsay kind of way? Right. So to the extent possible, if you have any respiratory disease like flu, flu is a great example, right? And again, we're in the middle of flu season and flu, flu disease and flu deaths still cause much, much, much more illness in this country than the, this novel coronavirus, which is not widely circulating. And there are no indications of it really circulating in our communities at this time, although we continue to monitor because, again, it is respiratory disease. But the flu is a great example. Um, if you think about when someone in your family is sick with the flu, um, some things that we have to think about are exactly those prevention measures, especially, particularly actually washing your hands, um, you know, because the, those respiratory droplets, you know, are so key in how we um, get infected. It's, it's keeping your distance from the sick person um, from washing your hands all the time as, you know, as, as frequently as possible. And then remember 20 seconds under the water um, and rubbing your hands uh, really well, not just like letting the hands, uh, letting the water, you know, just sort of wash through your hands. You really have to rub your hands um, front and back um, for 20 seconds. So good hand washing and then being mindful of, you know, not touching our face or um, so basically our, the, Mucous membranes are what are that lining inside our mouths, inside our nose, our eyes. Those mucous membranes are what's are what's susceptible to being um, uh, infected, essentially from um, not just this novel virus, but the flu from any pathogen. And so we really want to try to avoid touching our face with unwashed hands. And that that is probably one of the hardest things for all of us to do, myself included. You know, it's. It's something we all need to really think about, really consciously think about. Um, and, and that would probably be one really effective way if we could really prevent that from doing that, um, for our, could prevent ourselves from self-inoculating, if you will, yeah. um, with sort of pathogen, whether it's the novel coronavirus or flu or um, yeah. other pathogens. Well, what, what, what you suggest really is that, uh, that the world is full of pathogens and uh, uh, they don't necessarily go away in, in the sense mm -hmm. that somebody puts his hand down on a surface uh, or, or droplets fall on a surface and then you put your hand down there and you touch your you know, face, mucous membranes, the like, uh, you're going you're gonna to transmit it. So the, I think you have to, this, this event teaches us that we have to see the world perhaps in a different way. We have to see sure. every surface out there as a potential por point of infection. And that, that sure. includes being at home. So I, I also hear you saying that even if you are at home, you don't feel well, you're not going to go to the office, you're not going to work today, you're not going to go out of the community, and you're going to be with your family, uh, and you're infected, and your family is not infected. It is not a foregone conclusion that you will spread this disease or any infe infection like this um, to the people at home. You can prevent that even at home. Am I right? Right. Right. To the extent possible. I mean, we also recognize that some people may not realize they're ill with this. Uh, you know, I mean, how many people actually take themselves to the doctor immediately upon getting ill? You know, you tend to sort of try and uh, shoulder on and not, you know, not go see your doctor and not. And so you don't know that what you have is could be, um, you know, the flu or anything else. And um, so you may not be as careful or your loved ones may not realize you're sick, you know. 
Um, there could be any number of reasons, but this is where I would argue that we all need to be really mindful. And as soon as we start to feel ill, to start taking those precautions. And even before um, being starting to feel ill, we need to make these kind of um, prevention measures second nature. So not touching our face, um, washing our hands, cleaning surfaces. And I, I on that um, issue, I just want to mention that you know, these are, this is what we think, it, we think it's a coronavirus like any other coronavirus and that it's not likely to be um, hanging out on surfaces for hours and hours. I mean, it is susceptible to environmental, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, stresses, I, I suppose, if you could call it that. Um, but it, it, these things, these viruses will not be lasting there for hours. It's more a matter of Someone is, you know, it's just like flu. Someone sneezes or coughs on their hands, unfortunately, instead of into the, you know, crook of your elbow and then touches a doorknob or picks up a phone or picks or starts typing on a keyboard. And you come by, you know, maybe a few minutes later after they've left and then you start, you know, and it, maybe there's, it's still a little wet and you don't, you don't really realize it might be moist or something, and and then you pick that, and then you absentmindedly while you're doing something scratch your nose or you scratch your eye, you know, rub at your eyes. That's how we normally infect ourselves with these. Mm -hmm. um, but you do uh, have some personal control over it. So uh, you take me have, back to yeah. the, the home where I live with my family. I'm not feeling well. I have some kind of respiratory thing. Uh, it sounds like it's a good idea to keep the house really clean. All those surfaces. Clean sure. and, and stress out and the, the virus. It's susceptible to regular sanitation agents. It's you don't need anything special to clean surfaces for this. It's not norovirus. Um, you know, we're not talking about Ebola. We're, we're this is like many respiratory pathogens. So, mm -hmm. regular cleaning products. Um, you know, regular hand washing, and as I said, just, you know, just being mindful not to touch your face. But I mean, backing up a little. You know, we're talking about hopefully something that won't happen down the line. Um, and because we're talking in the, the theoretical of like when and if this virus is actually cir circulating in the community. Um, right now, it isn't as, as far as we can tell, um, but it is. And that's the ideal moment where, I mean, this is the ideal time when we should be practicing the prevention measures now before we're aware of anything because we make it second nature. Um, you know, and we practice these measures, then it's, it makes it even less likely that we'll see, you know, widespread circulating disease. I mean, if you imagine flu, flu, right, um, our flu uh, season right now, um, the traditional flu season that we're in the middle of, can you imagine how much less disease there would be um, here in Hawaii on, in the nation if people stayed home, definitely stayed home when they were um, sick, you know, didn't go to work or school, um, if they actually did wash their hands appropriately every time that they, you know, coughed and sneezed or if they handled something and that they didn't touch their hands, um, they touched their hands to their face, you know, absentmindedly rub their face, you know, after touching something else, you know. So, um, I mean, if you just imagine if people did that on a regular basis, I would, I would guess that we wouldn't really see a lot of flu out there, you know, mm -hmm. so it's something to think about. Yeah, yes, I mean, and especially going forward where these kinds of infections, we may see them on a regular basis, uh, depending on how the world works, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a large, complex world, um, it could happen again, in, in, in like SARS, like MERS, and now this one, there could be something else next year. Uh, Dr. Sarah right. Park, uh, state epidemiologist at the Department of Health, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. And we're going to ask Dr. Park, um, what's the difference between coronavirus virus and flu? And we're going to also ask her, you know, uh, what happens when you do feel sick and you feel like you might have it? What do you do then? We'll be right back. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. 
And I'm the host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're on every Wednesday at four o'clock, and we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV, to windmills, to hydrogen, close to my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at four o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Okay, we're back with Dr. Sarah Park, state epidemiologist at the Department of Health, talking about you know what, coronavirus, the new coronavirus. Uh, so Dr. Park, uh, I just wonder, what is the difference in terms of the, what do you call it, infectability, that's just probably not a medical word, uh, of, this, of this virus and, uh, and the standard household annual flu? Um, well, first off, I'm glad you, you qualified and said this is a new coronavirus because there are common, what we call common coronaviruses um, that, you know, that actually are regular laboratory tests. If you ever get tested for what's called the respiratory viral panel um, by your doctor, you get a nasal pharyngeal swab, a swab down your nose, and you get, the doctor sends it off. And it happens to come back positive and says positive coronavirus. It is not this coronavirus. It is not the novel coronavirus. There is currently no clinically available, commercially available lab test um, that can detect the novel coronaviruses. Common coronaviruses we know about um, usually cause more of a cold-like sim um, symptoms. Um, so it's kind of lumped together, lumped together with like the rhinoviruses and sort of the symptoms it causes. But this is very different, and it is different also from the flu. The flu viruses um, uh, are uh, well known to circulate, uh, at least in most of the rest of the world, um, seasonally. Um, you know, the traditional flu season being from May um, of, uh, I'm sorry, of September of one year to May of the next year. Um, for Hawaii, we see flu year round. Um, it causes uh, you know, basically aches and pains, um, fever, cough can occasionally lead to secondary uh, bacterial infections and um, you know most people do recover fortunately but after being you know laid up for a, at least a week some people unfortunately like those in extremes of age those with underlying illness um, you know pregnant women can be at risk for more severe disease and unfortunately death um, and this season we've seen quite a few of those nationally um, still, uh, it, it's, it's still around. This novel coronavirus is something that's exactly what the name says. It's new. It's, it's not been in the human world. It's uh, presumed to have crossed over very recently from the animal world, which animal we're not yet sure. It's not been discovered, um, it, uh, but it has its origins in the animal world and then mutated and came over. Anytime you have a new virus, um, these, uh, as, such as this one, just like with SARS, MERS, CoV, 2009 H1N1, you know, basically when you have a new virus, what that means is none of us have immunity against, we've never seen it. So our immune systems are like babies' immune, immune systems in that we've never seen it. So we're all equally susceptible. Um, the interesting thing right now is that some of the data coming out about, you asked about infectability or uh, um, we call that the r not in epidemiology. So for you know, every one person um, who has a particular infection, um, you know, the question is from you know, what is the r not? How many more people will that one person infect? We know for flu, the r not is about just about one. So for every person who has flu, they'll most likely infect one more person. Um, to give some background, I think Ebola, I want to say Ebola is probably around four or five or something like this. Um, I can't quite recall, but um, measles, which is the granddaddy of the, you know, of infectious diseases, um, it, it has an r naught of somewhere around 18. So wow. for every person, it, measles can uh, infect up to 18 susceptible individuals. Um, the data that's coming out right now, there's been one paper that suggested that the R naught, and it, I have to caution, it is still way early, you know, in this um, sort of understanding of this new virus. But the there was one paper that suggested that based on the available data, the R naught for this virus might be closer to just a little bit above two, so that everyone every one person 
um, can uh, infect at least two individuals. I think SARS was somewhere around that four or five. Um, so it basically what it means is the severity of illness that this virus is likely to cause and the, the scope of um, the infection is probably somewhere between the flu and, and SARS. Um, but we're just not sure exactly where it is. And again, what about lethality? What about the lethality? Is this is this more lethal than um, ordinary garden variety flu? So again, it is still very early in um, in trying to understand uh, you know this virus. The early, the data right now suggests that it it does potentially ha carry a high what we call mortality, but not for everyone for certain groups. So it has been it has been interesting the data that's coming out suggesting that. Somewhat older individuals, not necessarily elderly, but somewhat older individuals and those with underlying illness may be at more risk. But again, it's it's early. We don't know. Um, the mortality, you know, if you recall with SARS, the deaths um, that were reported with SARS, it took several months before those deaths were starting to sort of um, uh, be identified as or tend to occur. And so if you had you know, asked in the first couple of months, what's the mortality for SARS, you would have, you would have a very different number compared with four, five, six mm. months later, you have mm. more data. By the same token, if it is, if the disease doesn't actually cause as many deaths, you know, and, and everyone is just really hyper aware in the beginning, it could be that we see the death, death rate sort of level yeah. and it, that, that mortality rate isn't as high as Oh, yeah. some, so people, again, it, some people get hard. this disease and they they don't really even show it. Some people get this disease, it's very mild and they get over it. Um, but if you, are, if you are, if you are at home, you're talking about asymptomatic infection. And actually, um, I think there was a paper in the New England Journal that a bunch of German authors claimed that an individual with um, asymptomatic, um, no symptoms, right? Uh, infection um, infected four other individuals. And of course, everyone became very concerned because the assumption is that ace, if for any disease, that asymptomatic infection probably plays a very small role in transmission, if any. Um, and so there was a lot of concern until most recently, um, a few of those ger same German authors came forward and actually admitted that they had neglected to um, talk with the actual, actually talk to the individual an interview with the individual who was quote unquote asymptomatic and have subsequently found that that individual was not asymptomatic, actually had aches and pains and fever and had been taking um, what, you know, paracetamol, which is acetaminophen or Tylenol um, for their symptoms. So it seemed like they had no symptoms, but actually did. Um, and that, that makes more sense that they infected someone else. So it is, you know, every disease has what I like to say a spectrum of severity. Um, mm. Disease that sort of curve it varies. If you say that on the, you know, the zero point is like the very minor asymptomatic to the, you know, the maximum point out to the right uh, would be, you know, death, you know, and then, you know, numbers across the y-axis and you, you could have a nice, smooth bell curve, you could have a shifted one where most of the cases are severe, or you could have everyone up in the front where mostly mild. We don't know where this disease is going to fall. With SARS, we presume it was more shifted towards the severe. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, it's a new virus, so we're all susceptible, which doesn't doesn't uh, speak well for, you know, um, oh. it being, you know, the case that we're likely to see well, more mild. Suppose, uh, you know, I mean, right. suppose, uh, as, as, as the newspaper has said, ultimately, there's a fair chance we're going to see it pop up here. Um, simply because yeah. we, we have people coming from infected countries and quarantine right. is only so long. And before you know it, there's an infected person. Well, and, the, the quarantine and self-monitoring is, is quite uh, generous. It's not that, that is not the issue. The issue is other, you know, potentially other ways it gets here that, you know, people who are not recognized and, um, and potentially, you know, not in monitoring or in, or in quarantine. Um, we don't know exactly the incubation phase, that, that phase when, when you're infected or exposed to when you actually start developing symptoms. But based on known data for all coronaviruses, 
That's where that 14 days comes from because that is the maximum incubation period recognized for most coronaviruses. Wow. So it's probably generous. Um, so that's not, it's not likely that someone who's been appropriately monitored and quarantined is going to transmit to others. It's well, more- Let's assume for whatever, whatever reason- If someone were unrecognized before they were put in monitoring quarantine and maybe you know, transmitted to someone else. But that really is immaterial. It's more about, you know, we need to focus on the prevention measures that I was describing earlier and really about staying home when you're um, sick um, about washing your hands appropriately, about making sure right now, making sure nature- well, Let's assume for a moment that, you're, that you've taken those steps, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. you have a, a, a respiratory ailment that won't go away and you are getting very concerned about it. And you think maybe, right. maybe uh, you're having a bad day and you got it. You somehow got it right here in Hawaii. Uh, that's possible. So at that point, you're not sure. Uh, you don't know what to do. You stay home, but- and, and you feel threatened increasingly, uh, what do you do? Do you amble on down to the hospital? Do you, do you call your physician? Um, you do, call do you go to a quarantine center? That, that wouldn't no, sound like a good idea at all. Quarantine centers. No, no, there are no quarantine centers, first of all. And second of all, we do not have um, circulating virus here so that, you know, if you start to feel ill with fever or cough or shortness of the more likely issues, you've got the flu. And it is a good idea to call ahead to your clinician, your healthcare provider, to sort of let them know about your concerns and schedule an appointment as needed. Um, if you are really having that shortness of breath and really having an emergency, then you need to call, you know, obviously the emergency medical services folks. But, um, you know, right now the risks are for travelers from China. That is what we are looking at. That's what we're working, collaborating very closely with our federal partners. Um, and those people, it's it's very critical for healthcare workers. That's a very critical question to ask of anyone who comes in with um, what we call a febrile respiratory illness is where have they traveled in the last 14 days? Um, because if it were China and specifically Hubei province, then obviously we'd have a concern and um, we'd have to consider this uh, particular infection. But for everyone else, we're seeing plenty of flu activity, by the way. We're seeing an increase mm -hmm. of flu activity in Hawaii. Uh, we are, as I've mentioned repeatedly, we're in the middle of flu season, the traditional flu season. Um, I, you know, before all the um, attention on what's going on in China, if you recall back in early December, November, um, there was a lot of media coverage over the fact that the mainland was suffering one of the worst flu seasons on record. Um, and then suddenly everyone switched gears to cover what was going on in China. Well, I'm here to tell you that just because the media has suddenly shifted focus does not mean that flu, di flu disease suddenly went away. So <laughs> facilities on the mainland, as well as here, are still seeing plenty of flu. And... Um, the way flu presents um, with the symptoms, you know, that fever, cough, aches and pains, it's going to be very similar to this virus. And, you know, when this virus is, you know, finally actually in U.S. communities, and you can imagine if we're not vaccinated, vaccinated against flu, if we're not pra practicing our um, good infection prevention measures, I mean, then we're going to be, it's going to be very problematic. We're going to see this incredible burden on our healthcare facilities. Um, trying to manage not only this now new concern, but also existing flu disease. Well, thank you, Dr. Park. Dr. Sarah Park, state epidemiologist at the Department of Health. There's so many more questions, and I hope we can, we can catch up with you again. I know it's going to be busy for you while this is still in the newspapers and so, but I hope we can catch up again and, and keep current on the status, not only in the world, but in Hawaii. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.